Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, GMOE Academic Subcommittee. Today's topic will be the common ENT problems in general practice. And uh, I'm joined here um, by uh, Dr. MTD Lakshan, consultant ENT and head and neck surgeon of the Navaloka Hospital, Colombo. Um, good morning to you, sir. Uh, he is also a senior lecturer at the University of Kalania. So, um, to uh, go ahead uh, with our topic, I, uh, let me briefly introduce um, uh, Dr. MTD Lakshan. He, um, while uh, serving as a lecturer, a senior lecturer at University of Kalania, uh, he has uh, qualified in uh, his MS Otolaryngology Auto and Head and Neck Surgery since 2007. And uh, he's further qualified uh, with the DOHNS, um, awarded by the Royal College of Surgeons of London, the FRCS ORL HNS by the University of Edinburgh, UK, uh, FEB ORL NHS, um, which is from the European Board of uh, Examination in Otolaryngology and Head and Neck Surgery and also is a member of the American Academy of Otolaryngology and Head and Neck Surgery since 2018. So uh, to um, continue with our topic today, common ENT problems in general practice, um, I would uh, like to hand over to uh, Dr. 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 P.T. Laksha. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your kind words of introduction. And I'd like to uh, thank uh, GMOA for inviting me to deliver this lecture. Let me share my screen with you now. Uh, I think uh, now all of you can see the screen. Can all of you see if there are any issues? Is that okay? Technically now we can see, right? Okay, you can hear me also, right? Okay, so uh, today, today we are going to discuss uh, about common ENT, you know, throat related conditions that you might come across in your general practice. Uh, and uh, since uh, uh, since we have only a limited time today, uh, I don't think we can uh, cover everything. Uh, however, right, so uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, like ground rules before we go ahead. Uh, first of all, uh, it's better to keep the mics off, that might uh, disturb others. And also, uh, we like to keep it as interactive as much as possible. There's a small uh, app that we, we can use for this i'll show you how to join and then uh, you can scan the qr code there and use your phone to answer a couple of questions that i have put uh, into the uh, presentation and uh, i will be concentrating more on like casualty emergency sort of aspect of common ent conditions simply because those are the things that you shouldn't uh, miss and those things have a bearing uh, to patients outcome more than uh, cold conditions so most of our th uh, things that we are going to discuss will have a flavor of uh, emergency casualty um, that will be useful i feel and i'll make this material available uh, through the gmoa if you want to download and get the pictures and all so therefore you don't have to write down anything you can follow uh, with the slides so this is the qr code uh, if you have a phone with you now you can use the qr code that will take you to a, uh, a website where the questions can be answered. So then we we'll all can see what you uh, think of the questions that I ask you from to answer. This is the QR code. Take a moment uh, and I'll give you uh, the QR code in the future as well. Right. So when it comes to emergencies and casualties in common ENT situation, one important thing that you need to know is real emergency is airway obstruction because uh, that is the most critical of uh, casualties or emergencies as ENT surgeons we face day, day in and day out. Uh, and even in other branches, if you take accident service, uh, any other medical condition or any surgical specialty, airway obstruction would be the key that we need to be aware of. And as ENT and head and neck surgeons, we are called in to see patients with airway obstructions. Uh, So uh, when it comes to airway obstruction, the key symptom that 
will uh, show that there's no airway obstruction is strido. There's a difference between uh, strido and sterto. Uh, that is, sterto is a sound that you get uh, when you are uh, snoring in the night. That abnormal sound that you can get, you can hear, is called uh, sterto. Whereas strido is a very significant airway sound where patients uh, can get uh, breathing difficulty and a noisy breathing because of airway obstruction. The concept of airway adequacy is the most important thing. Whether the patient can have good oxygenation is the most important thing. There are five things that you need to know. Strido, respiratory rate increase, recessions, increased pulse rate and cyanosis. So we are not going to deal uh, too much about uh, accident and uh, emergency service, emergency care here because we are concentra concentrating more on the general practice aspect of it. I have just put this slide because these are the signs of airway adequacy or inadequacy. You need to know these things in your practice if a patient comes with breathing difficulty, they are strido. Don't wait till the patient uh, become really bad or cyanosed. Send the patient to uh, acute care treatment unit as quickly as possible. Check the respiratory rate. If the patient is having labored or very high rate of breathing, that may indicate some problem. And there's recessions, obviously you can see that patient is not doing well and tachycardia and cyanosis. Cyanosis is pretty late, so don't wait till cyanosis happens. So those are the features of airway adequacy. So this is the first question that I want you to answer if you can. Uh, use your phone or laptop and try to answer this question. What would be the last feature to appear in airway obstruction? Just a teaser. Uh, it's a very easy question. So that will give us like uh, for you to uh, use this app also then uh, then we can see yes uh, we are getting responses now you can also see in the slides how people are answering cyanosis seems to be the favored answer right so it's pretty clear so we'll move on so we've got four responses and uh, all of them uh, seems to think cyanosis is the last uh, of the signs and uh, they're absolutely correct so we'll move on so when it comes to airway adequacy check-in uh, the one, one of the tests that we do is uh, fiber optic assessment. Now this is a small short clip from YouTube and you can see how we do this. I'm sure everyone uh, has seen this uh, during their hospital practice and in the general practice setting we may not be able to have this gadget available for you uh, because these are expensive gadgets. I just uh, put this gadget, it's a fiber optic, uh, fiber optic nasopharyngolaryngoscopy O F N E L. Uh, the advantage of this is, as you can see, we can check the nose, back of the nose, the post nasal space, whether there's any adenoid enlargement or anything, the palate, and then you can move on and go on to the voice box, the vocal cords, the arytenoids. You can see whether they are moving nicely and whether there is enough space for the patient to breathe. So, this is a very good uh, instrument to have, equipment to have in uh, our setting, in the hospital setting, to check whether there is any airway obstruction. So I think uh, that's enough about the airway adequacy thing. I just want to keep it uh, simply because this is really important to know uh, as the most important emergency in the ENT aspect. Now we'll go on uh, sections, rhinology, otology and throat ENT wise and we'll start with the rhinology, nose uh, uh, common conditions. The commonest conditions you might see is epistaxis bleeding from the nose. There may be foreign bodies in the nose, there will be nasal bone fractures, hematomas. We'll go along these topics now one by one. Epistaxis. I'm sure epistaxis bleeding from the nose is uh, a very common condition patients come to uh, general practice. Most of the time, 99.9 point uh, of the time, it's a simple thing. It's not a, like a dangerous thing. However, when you uh, watch media, you see uh, bleeding from the nose is signified as like something extremely bad, extremely dangerous, uh, patient is going to die. So, it's like a, one of the last uh, symptoms the patients will have. Unfortunately, uh, it's not so, <laughs> actually fortunately, it's not so bad uh, when it comes to practice. Uh, there are three principles when it comes to managing a patient with nasal bleeding. Resuscitation, arrest of bleeding and finding the cause. When a patient is bleeding, in, as in any other specialty, we need to resuscitate. And we need to stop the bleeding, we need to find the cause. 
So what do you think which one of the principles below should be done first? Is the resuscitation part or arresting of the bleeding or finding the cause, all of the above or none of the above? So arrest of the bleeding seems to be favored. Okay, so 17% seems to think all of above should be the answer. Let it hang on for a couple of seconds now. At least we get 10 responses. We've got 8. Right, okay. So, uh, actually, it's a tricky question. Actually, I wanted to trick you all. Sorry about it. Because it's all about, all of above. Because uh, although you have put resuscitation as a principle, that is correct. We need to resuscitate the patient. But we can't resuscitate the patient until we arrest the bleeding. And if you find the cause, uh, if you don't find the cause, sometimes we can't arrest the bleeding also. So it, all three principles have to go in parallel in epistaxis. So uh, that's what I just want to do. And also to practice you on this uh, app also. Right, this is the commonest uh, reason that patients get bleeding. Uh, this is a picture of the nasal septum, the wall that divides the nose into two. Can you see there are some blood vessels here? Some uh, dilated blood vessels. Now, this is called the little area, little area, the uh, part of the septum where there is anastomosis between uh, uh, blood vessels, especially from the anterior circulation and posterior circulation on the carotid system, external and internal. In this area, these capillaries tend to get dilated and uh, when you pick the nose, when you touch the nose or traumatize, there can be troublesome bleeding. This is very common in children. So, in your general practice, a lot of patients, uh, parents will bring their kids with uh, bleeding from the nose and if you look up uh, through the nose with good illumination, you might see this. This is the commonest reason. So uh, what would be the like the uh, first aid that you would recommend? Now, I know most of the doctors say uh, put some ice or just uh, put some water. Uh, very rarely that uh, we get the proper advice. The proper advice you should give your patient is to press on the sides like this way and apply the pressure like this way onto the septum and how long should you give apply the pressure yeah the pressure should be applied 10 minutes why 10 minutes no, why not 5 minutes why not 15 10 minutes is the average clotting time so 10 minutes is a very long time so if you keep there it only took three seconds still so what happens is patients apply the pressure and let it go and see whether it has stopped prematurely so that is not the best thing so we ask them to keep the pressure for 10 minutes by the clock that will settle 99.9 .9 of your bleedings and after that we can use some nasal steroid sprays and antihistamines that will get rid of this inflammation and if it is still troublesome then we will climb on the and this is another picture of the uh, anastomosis of blood vessels uh, there is some, we'll climb on the epistaxis ladder, pressure and ice, pressure, apply the pressure on that area, uh, ice will reduce the uh, circulation, but pressure. And if that doesn't help, the second step would be to cauterize with silonitrate. Uh, I don't know how many general practice, uh, practices will have silonitrate with them and if you don't have the facility, don't proceed with that. The reason is if you uh, don't properly do it you can cause damage and usually ENT units uh, all, all over the country have this uh, facility it's a very straightforward thing to do and then we have a couple of packings one is called anterior packing the other one is posterior packing you can pack from the front there are proprietary brands like Mirosel and rapid rhinos beep and then posterior packings like uh, NG uh, we can put a uh, four disc catheter and do a pack in there there are proprietary PNS balloons also and if all this doesn't work, we take the patient to theater and do ligations, uh, spinopalatine, anterior ethmoidal and things like that. The last resort would be sometimes even if ligation doesn't help, uh, we can go for radiological interventions, arterial embolizations, very commonly done in Sri Lanka also now. Now these are pictures, some of the pictures you can see in this patient, uh, uh, the septum blood vessels I showed you earlier have been uh, cauterized. That area is completely uh, now uh, wiped away with uh, silonitrate. 
this is anterior packing layer by layer packing uh, i don't think in the general practice you may have to do that but if the patients bleed in before they come to uh, an ent unit you can do a packing at your practice before you send that will save the patient's life this is the foley's catheter these are marrow cell packs these are expandable packs you can put that uh, into the nose and put saline and then that will swell up and control the bleeding it's better to have if you have uh, like resources to keep one or two in your practice in an uncontrollable patient you can use this and put it in the nose and put some saline that will stop the bleeding right so that's about bleeding from the nose and if you have any questions you can either send through the chat box or like uh, ask at the end i will move on to the other topics uh, uh, for the sake of uh, time foreign bodies the other common practice in the general uh, situation is the patients are brought to uh, general practice saying that this usually a child or toddler put something in their ear nose or throat now we are talking about the nose foreign bodies here now this picture classically shows uh, what people say as the uh, rule of thumb if there is a unilateral one sided ear discharge that is a foreign body until proven otherwise So this patient has a foreign body, most probably on the left side, because if it is upper respiratory tract infection, usually there should be bilateral, both sides discharge. If one side is discharging, you need to think maybe there is something inside. It's a common mistake in general practice. I've seen quite a lot of patients come in to us after three to six months of treatment with antibiotics and nose drops, uh, not going away. Then to see there is a seed or something inside the nose. Uh, so, if you are if your patient is having one-sided discharge, always consider the possibility. And also, if the patient is not improving with your usual uh, upper respiratory tract treatment, consider getting an ENT opinion. Okay. So, what do you think the most dangerous foreign body in the nose? You can type. I think you can send your uh, responses. Uh, what do you think the most dangerous foreign body in the nose? Uh, for example now sometimes we see uh, pebbles sometimes we see uh, even insects inside the nose sometimes we see oh we are getting small batteries as the answer some say button batteries okay good coin coin is another option someone wants to say seeds yes someone has mentioned seeds it's very common sometimes we see um, this uh, cimbala and other tamarind atta and all that yeah i think most seems to see the batteries uh, as the uh, important the most uh, dangerous foreign body they are absolutely right batteries you need to know that because uh, even these seeds coins coins are really unusual but yeah anyway possible whatever the other foreign bodies they are not going to cause harm the small batteries that batteries in the uh, like watches and uh, toys down small size rounded batteries can cause damage to the nasal structures even the septum and damage cribriform plate the more you keep the battery in the nasal cavity the more damage you are likely to get so as a result when these patients come with batteries in the nose we don't wait till they are properly fasted we take them to theater immediately this has to be removed in the theater difficult to remove otherwise right so good right so very good so that's that's about the nose foreign bodies now we'll move on to nasal trauma again in the uh, your general practice patients might come uh, with injuries to their head and neck area and there may be nose trauma right like for this patient now you can immediately see the wall is bent and there are like some discoloration under the eyes suggestive of uh, maybe like small hematoma developing there ecchymosis so these patients when do you think uh, we should operate these patients should we operate all these patients or are there like uh, any indications if you think of any indications you can say it. type it out yeah so just because you see a fracture on the nasal uh, x-ray we are not going to do any surgeries there are three indications for surgery i think a couple of participants are typing we'll let them uh, send their answers symptomatic yeah one of the things uh, is even if the x-ray does if they shows a fracture 
if the patient doesn't have a deformity there's no symptomatic deformity there's no need to do any surgery we can just leave it alone undisplaced fractures we don't have to operate a uh, good this breathing affected uh, is a, a very important thing i'll show you why continued bleeding extremely correct because the patient is having a continuous bleeding we can't just let them uh, bleed uh, continuously and die we have to take to theater open fracture here is another indication so this is the breathing difficulty issue that we are talking about hematoma in the nasal uh, septum because of the fracture the nasal bone the blood can go into uh, the septum under the perichondrium and cause something called septal hematoma you can see here how the nasal septum is bulging on both the sides and the patient can't breathe we operate these patients early not because of the breathing difficulty but because of cartilage damage if you keep on uh, having this uh, hematoma for a long while as you know the cartilage anywhere in the body depends on uh, the, uh, the perichondrium for their nutrition and oxygen uh, supply so when you have a collection under the perichondrium that cartilage is going to necrose if we don't restore that uh, perfusion and nutrition so we need to remove that we need to remove the, uh, the hematoma as quickly as possible right so other thing is this orbital cellulitis condition that i want to highlight to you today because one of the commonest uh, conditions that you see is sinusitis when it comes to nose part in ent um, sinusitis management what i have seen uh, the way how the general practitioners have managed is quite okay there are no like major problems uh, the way that you manage sinusitis you use nose drops you use uh, antihistamines and you diagnose it uh, with x-rays and clinical features uh, there are no like major labs there important thing you need to know are like what could go wrong what are the dangers of sinusitis out of that is orbital cellulitis now this patient is a young child who has a very large edematous right eye erythematous and the eyes completely closed there's ptosis and there's a bit of proptosis also you can see it from the top of the row uh, the head if you look so why this is related to sinusitis it is because ethmoid sinusitis can spread to orbital cavity and cause uh, orbital abscesses and if that is not drained properly you can get blindness even so this is a medical emergency so if your patient with sinusitis that you have been treating come in with eye symptoms red dye or whatever early phases don't wait uh, till the last moment because that may be a dangerous complication uh, when we have been trained and taught on ENT we were told that you can get frontal abscesses and uh, intracranial abscesses as a complication of sinusitis but they are very rare these days we don't uh, see that as like as uh, commonly as used to be most probably because of proper management maybe uh, general practitioners are very uh, i mean very much aware of these conditions they uh, do a good job sometimes there may be other wrong practice also that could give rise to that which is indiscriminate use of antibiotics because uh, for each and every condition sometimes we see antibiotics have been prescribed and that in a way it will reduce these dangerous complications but there are other uh, major issues with this antibiotic use and i don't want to uh, go elaborate on those things because these are very common knowledge and i don't want to uh, spend time on that uh, so remember about orbital cellulitis in your sinus sinus patients now this is the ct scan of that patient you can see the collection under the eye here right that's about uh, the nose now we'll move on to ear right ear commonest condition that you might see related to ear is not uh, ear ache but vertigo so why i have put this as the commonest thing simply because when vertigo patients come most of the time the doctors uh, tend to think this could be a heart issue or pressure has gone up or some brain uh, stroke or something most of the time the vertigo patients have an ear issue so we can actually have three classic Uh, presentations of uh, vertigo we can have single episode or we can have multiple episodes of vertigo or maybe maybe we be having a chronic dizziness there's no vertigo but patient is off balance these are three different distinct clinical categories 
patient has been all all uh, always okay and until this episode came up and single episode of severe dizziness or patient is okay but multiple acute episodes or patient doesn't have acute vertigos but they are chronically dizzy the diagnosis the way we manage and uh, how, uh, the treatment is quite different investigation are quite different and this is not the forum to discuss vertigo we'll discuss uh, in a different day but remember here is really important these categorizations are important i'll give you the commonest reasons in each each of these categories the single episode the commonest reason is vestibular neuronitis the patient has been doing well and suddenly you get very severe vertigo when you look at them they are vomiting and uh, nauseated they can't go around because of the imbalance multiple small uh, acute episodes may be because of vestibular migraine that is one of the commonest reasons vestibular migraine it may be meniere's disease might may be benign paroxysmal positional vertigo especially on assuming a position on the bed <clears throat> that's only about a minute it's not very short lasting if a short lasting positional vertigo comes you have to think of bppv benign paroxysmal positional now coming back to the last category the chronic dizziness one of the commonest one is something called pppd persistent postural perceptual dizziness i think these diagnostic labels are probably new to you because when you were trained probably these were not identified as such and now with the advancement of uh, neuro otology and vestibule assessments these diagnoses are coming and the way we manage these patients have become different has changed now, the, the olden days everyone used to get a beta sir call extemetil osteogerone and uh, they are not very happy patient they are not getting better and the doctors are also not happy they want to they don't want to see vertigo patients because they, they are, it's a headache for the doctors also so it was a very unhealthy business there both to the patient and to the doctor so now with the advancement of clinical assessments and uh, diagnostic labels and managements things have become much better and vertigo patients are the most grateful patients ever because uh, they are really suffering and if you cure them they will be really happy and we when you have acute single episode we like to differentiate them from central and peripheral in your general practice if a patient comes with sudden vertigo the thing that should worry you is could this be a cerebral hemorrhage or a brain stem infarction or vestibular neuronitis as i told you the commonest reason the difference between vestibular neuronitis and labyrinthitis is that in labyrinthitis there's hearing loss also in vestibular neuronitis you don't get hearing loss i'll show a small video of one of our patients just see this video and see what you can see any abnormality yeah there you go so when you do the head movements yeah so when we do the head movements this is uh, called uh, head impulse test when you do the, that side the patient oh, first of all i'll tell you what the patient has been asked to do the patient is asked to see at a straight line and we are changing the head portion from side to side um, since uh, we are doing this video recording of this patient i have put the camera in front of the patient this is obviously covid time as you can see the dress and all very ppe right so uh, so when we do the movement to the patient's right nothing happens but when you turn the patient to left ear left side nothing happened on to that side but to left side there is a jerky movement of the eye so let's see that again this is a simple test that you uh, test you can do at uh, your general practice nothing happens there's a jerky movement there right so you can uh, see that at later in your convenience so that in the case there is a vestibular failure on the left ear typical of vestibular neuronitis so that's a simple test as good as an mri scan you can do at your general practice if a patient comes with vertigo and if that test is positive if there's a jerk be happy because there's a peripheral cause is not having a stroke so although they are symptomatic so there are studies uh, on this being done in accident and emergency service and a group of the patient had an mri scan a group had just this and treatment 
An MRI scan, as you know, up to 48 hours, there may not be any changes even if there's a stroke. But this has a very good positive predictive value. The second thing that you need to know about uh, an ear is uh, sudden sensory neural hearing loss. Why this is important is if a patient comes with hearing impairment, the ear looks very nice, there's no problem here. So if the hearing loss is due to like wax impaction or an infection, that's okay because we have time for us to manage that, clean it out, put antibiotic drops. But if the ear looks very nice and the patient can't hear, that's an emergency. Because if the nerve is damaged and it's not working well, if you don't start the proper management within 24 to 48 hours, the success rate of recovery is very low. So this is a message that I think the general practitioner should know. Because uh, unlike the, in the case of eye, where if you lose your vision, you will rush to doctors. The, if you lose your hearing, patients tend to wait a little and see whether it will recover. That's mistake. So if a patient comes with hearing loss to you, uh, you can uh, actually arrange for a hearing test by your local closest uh, ENT treatment unit and take it forward from there. When it comes to treatment, what we usually use uh, are steroids. Steroids can be used systemic systemically with tablets or uh, to the ear we can inject steroids, transtympanic. The studies are uh, equivocal which one is better. Most of the time the patients get systemic steroids unless they have a very bad diabetic control or something like that. In that case, the steroid can be injected into the ear, like dexamethasone into the ear. The third uh, emergency or like uh, important thing that you need to know with ear problems is facial weakness. Uh, don't label all facial weakness as Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy is idiopathic facial nerve palsy without any cause. And, uh, why ENT surgeons are interested in facial nerve palsy is there are so many ENT related conditions that can give rise to facial weakness. Obviously, as you know, the middle ear is related to the facial nerve. So, chronic suppurative otitis media, cholesteatomas, and other ear infections, even non cholesteatomatous uh, ear infections, can cause facial weakness. So, you need to put your horoscope in the ear and have a look. In addition, there can be parotid tumors, again ENT related issue, where parotid neoplasms can cause facial nerve palsy. And we go in further, we can have parapharyngeal space lesions, like parapharyngeal uh, neuromas, even secondary deposits can be there. So we have to open the mouth and see where the tonsil is. And of course, in uh, intracranially also there can be lesions, acoustic neuromas, etc. can go and give rise to facial weakness. So unless and until you have ruled out secondary causes, you can't diagnose Bell's palsy. That's the other mistake that people can make. So just examine the other areas for a possible etiology. And if it's not there, we can call it idiopathic. This is another common condition patients will come to you in ENT with the ear condition, the red swollen ear. Uh, so the diagnosis here is perichondritis. Uh, why have I put it there? Why it's so important about this is just like septal hematoma, if you don't treat this condition quickly, you can get damage to the ear cartilage and there can be deformity of the ear cartilage and you can get cauliflower ear the ear can get dis deformed. Another common condition, kids can come with pain in the ear on the back of the ear, in the mastoid region, it's swollen. So this is mastoiditis. Again, better get early intervention, don't uh, wait here because there can be intracranial complications. Doctors can, uh, I mean ENT units can drain it uh, to prevent that and insects in the ear. So that's another common condition that uh, patients come to you in general practice. Uh, what do you think? You should, should you try to take it out or should you send to the ENT unit as quickly as possible? Well, my recommendation is don't try to take it out for two reasons. The first, you may not be successful without uh, proper training and in instruments at your place. Second thing is, 
if there is damage and likely there is going to be damage because these uh, insects cause damage to the eardrum and all you are going to get the blame <laughs> because the patient comes and when we find that there is an abnormality they will say that particular doctor tried to remove it now after that my eardrum is not working and damaged and all that so i think best would be to like neutralize these insects maybe using some form of ear lotion that will relieve the pain you can use even water you can use olive oil you can use whatever but send these patients quickly to the emergency any department where they can uh, do a proper job and most of these patients need a trip to the theater because we don't try to remove them as outpatient we may not be able to take all the bits and pieces uh, at the outpatient and uh, under anesthesia it's not painful it's very easy uh, we can quickly remove that uh, and that will be the best outcome for the patient it's another common condition coming to general practice you can see painful ear and it's swollen at the tragal level here so pharyncal in the outer ear otitis externa the commonest reason for this is what cotton buds you can see here fungal infection cotton buds cotton buds these cotton buds cause in all these uh, blot in blot in paper like appearance whitish stuff in the middle ear debris so all fungal infections and otitis externa they are all caused by cotton buds so the ear is a self cleaning organ so as in a general practice you can educate your patients who are coming with ear pains and all not to clean your ear with cotton buds or any other instrument like a can hander or any other gadget um, because ear is a self cleaning organ the debris the wax any other part will come out naturally migrate it out when you try to clean with a instrument it just pushes things in and cause more trouble uh, when they come to us in the ENT what we do is we have suction machine so we can suck it out under direct vision or maybe uh, with the help of uh, ear endoscopes as in my practice or microscope uh, as in general practice so that is that and uh, this is another florid appearance of fungal infection you can see the fungal filaments even in the ear ear cleaning so in our part of the world where there's a lot of uh, sweat and people uh, uh, use cotton buds it's a very common problem in your general practice you will see this very frequently so what are you going to do about this one thing you can say that don't use this again but you can use some topical anti fungal ear drops there are various preparations proprietary preparations i'm sure you are aware of you can use them the most important treatment however not the drop the treatment is cleaning you need to remove this uh, if you have the instruments and equipment you can do it you need a headlight and you need a suction machine you can generally suck it out uh, but if you are not having the instruments don't try to clean it yourself you can send it to the ENT unit uh, the reason is these are painful procedures because they are already in pain so when you try to clean they might shake their hand you might end up with damage so this is another painful ear coming to general practice acute otitis media can see how red and angry looking the eardrum is it's bulging it's about to break how do you treat that with ear drops or nose drops obviously nose drops that's why i would ask otherwise so it's a nose drops because the eardrum is now bulging so if you put the ear drops it's not going to be useful anyway it's going to hit the eardrum and come back out immediately but if you put the nose drops ear and the nose are connected internally through the eustachian tubes and you can use there are two sorts of nose drops we recommend decongestants and steroid combinations so decongestant will open up the station tube then you can put the second steroid combination and systemic antibiotics in the oral form may be a good idea because this ear looks very uh, inflamed and there is like bulging so maybe coamoxiclav or that category of antibiotics with a painkiller nsaid with paracetamol maybe combination would be a good idea and usually they resolve now if you look at the guidelines uh, especially the uk guidelines there's no recommendation for antibiotics they say they are self limiting you just use the nose drops they are going to be okay but i don't know in our practice we see quite a lot of agony patients are having pain and i don't see a lot of uh, problem with using antibiotics in this condition right so this is another common thing that you might see in your practice 
you can see the trauma traumatized ear drum because in sri lanka uh, the national game is slapping the ear i think because so for whatever the reason uh, when they go into <laughs> go into a brawl or discussion or argument they end up in slapping each other's ears and we poor ent surgeons have to deal with these problems and uh, you can immediately see and other other problem is uh, the patient will come and say i just fell and hit the head on the side and now you see when you look at the ear this one and you know that is not the truth that see they are just lying and this someone has actually attacked anyway whatever the reason uh, don't worry too much about this because this is going to heal usually these traumatic perforations are going to heal uh, you leave about uh, 24 uh, about a month keep the ear dry don't let the water go in it will heal on its own waxing patients another common problem that you will see in ent practice in your gen gp practice if you have as i said uh, um, good horoscope and you have headlights and suction you can remove wax no problem uh, but if you don't have instruments don't try to remove it because for the same reason because if there's any problem happens usually the patients come and tell us it's that particular doctor who did this to me and now i'm suffering uh, but of course they're strong if you have the facilities of course you can do it uh, and previously ear syringe was the most uh, traditional uh, common way to clean the ears and now the there's a shift towards suction than washing because of the fungal infections and other problems if there's a perforation under the ear uh, under the wax piece if you use syringe it might actually push things into the middle ear as well so suction would be a better option as always uh, compared to uh, preliminary syringe right so this is a good question uh, just have a good look at this picture this is a patient who comes with a swelling to your ear uh, general practice with a lump like appearance on the ear lobule what do you think now the question time what is the first line management of this condition this condition i have just put a couple of options incision and drainage observation antibiotics antihistamines pressure bandage i got about five five responses i think almost all have probably gone now they are now bored i think 12 20 now <laughs> right okay yeah i think uh, majority of the nine responses seems to think incision and drainage is the correct way forward um, i think they are absolutely right it's not antihistamines it's not observation it's not antibiotic or pressure bandage it's incision and drainage the reason is just like in the nasal septum if you don't drain this this cartilage is going to get necros so that's the other mistake in general practice you can make you can give antibiotics and wait on these patients don't do that send them to an ent unit where we need to drain it as quickly as possible ear foreign bodies just like in the nose you can get these pebbles and other things in the ear if you have the instruments you can remove them if not don't remove them especially don't use a forceps to remove that because if you use a forceps it will push the ball internally you know just like a sphere spheres are difficult to grasp with a, a crocodile forceps you can use a hook go beyond that and pull it towards you that might work um, but uh, forceps is not a good idea at all again acute otitis media very clear but in this patient there is no pain so what could be the presentation yeah here in loss they might come and tell the the ear is blocked so this is a glue ear glue ear is collection of mucus in the middle ear again the treatment is nasal decongestants and nasal steroids with that little this is it usually after upper respiratory tract infection cotton buds again cause in trauma to the external ear canal so treatment advise them not to use cotton buds and keep the ear dry maybe a short course of antibiotics because there's blood then it might get secondary infection on there so you might ask i am so against this cotton buds uh why what can you use that for you can use cotton buds to stroke little birds but nothing else because uh, it's all trouble nothing else throat 
So if you look at the throat here, this patient has a classic diagnosis of tonsillitis, acute tonsillitis. This might come to your general practice as one of the commonest, commonest, commonest causes of ENT related uh, thro sore throats. So what do you do? The, the recommended treatment is if it's really pustular tonsillitis like this one with the patient is really troublesome, start antibiotics. Coamaxiclav category or cefuroxime category or cefixime category would be like uh, the first lines. Can use additionally uh, metronidazole and also gargles with betadine to clear away this thing and of course you need uh, painkillers because they are really painful and uh, antihistamines may or may not be useful but most important thing is the antibiotic in this patient but sometimes the caveat is sometimes you uh, even Epstein-Barr viral infections uh, infections mononucleosis can give rise to pustular looking appearance tonsils you are not very sure whether this is bacterial or uh, viral and some viral patients this Coamax club can cause uh, a rash as a side effect so there you need to be a bit careful uh, oral penicillin would be a safe choice if you think that is a viral infection because even if it's a viral infection some form of antibiotic might be useful uh, to prevent secondary bacterial infection the dreaded bacterial infection we are worried about is streptococcus pyogenes as you know because it can it can cause rheumatic carditis and other complications and the, if the patient has recurrent tonsillitis six episodes or more refer them to ENT units for removal tonsillectomy so tonsillar stones can happen here and there again uh, common condition coming to ENT you can ask them to gargle it out uh, no need of like surgery or anything uh, you can anesthetize locally and remove it at your practice also if they are really large but uh, gargling and mouth wishes are the mainstay of treatment and if uh, the tonsil infection doesn't get properly controlled you can get a peritonsillar abscess like in this patient the abscess on that side of the right side and it's pushing the uvula to one side so these patients in your general practice you can drain that is not a problem it's easy to do you can anesthetize this area the tip of this arrow here uh, with a lignocaine spray and make a nick incision there and that will drain the pus out immediately uh, with large volumes and that will be relieving the pain and pressure for the patient and they will be really grateful another peritonsil abscess here very prominent very clearly seen the other thing is so these foreign bodies in the throat they come to your general practice as well uh, always check the tonsillar area this area because this is the common area for small foreign bodies you can see it here and remove it with your instruments and headlights sometimes they are a bit deep down like this in the piriform sinus then we can remove it with endoscopes upper J endoscopy with a flexible without anesthesia or if you think that's uh, stuck up really ha hard we can go for direct laryngoscopy and esophagoscopy on the rigid basis under general anesthesia either way the foreign bodies have to be taken out because otherwise you can get parapharyngeal abscesses and local complications this is the foreign body taken out Right, so this is a foreign body which has given rise to a retropharyngeal abscess. You can see this is one of our patients. You can see this area is bulging. The problem of this bulge and retropharyngeal abscess is it might drain into the airway and cause airway problems. To be careful with that. This is epiglottitis, very unlikely that you will see in uh, your practice. You can see how the normal epiglottis and severely inflamed epiglottis in epiglottitis and there is a tube here because of the airway compromise the patient is in the ICU probably there is a thumb up sign actually this x-ray shouldn't be there it shouldn't exist the reason is you shouldn't take x-rays if you suspect epiglottitis you should immediately take them to a safe control environment like theater and get the anesthetist pediatric uh, pediatrician or like and, and also ENT surgeon to be ready to do an airway intervention and after the airway intervention once things settle down only you should think of x-rays and other things this patient might also come to your general practice with swelling under the submandibular region under the jaw that is a feature of Ludwig's angina. be careful there may be um, airway obstruction in these patients can start antibiotics and check out for like dental problems 
and get a detailed opinion. Uh, and if it's persistently there, we may have to do ultrasound scans and find needle aspiration, things like that to rule out any lymph nodes uh, pathologies. It's a dangerous thing in the foreign bodies in the airway. They might also come to your GP practice saying that something has got aspirated. Now, this is a pretty ba bad situation where you have a foreign body right between the vocal cords and patient is stridulous and is most likely a radio opaque foreign body, something like uh, steel or something like that. Uh, and uh, these procedures, of course, have to be done in theater under general anesthesia. This is a patient who came to us in LRH actually, uh, when Dr. Asavardhana was my trainer. And this patient has had a, a small piece of foreign body aspirated. And it has gone on to uh, the main bronchus here, the right main bronchus. And it has obstructed the right main bronchus there. And this is the foreign body. So I think with that we can conclude the session. So we have uh, in summary gone through uh, rhinological. Immediately the one of the most important complications that you need to do emergency is the AV obstruction. We have discussed that. And then we moved on to rhinological conditions. Then we move on to ear conditions. And lastly we discuss the throat conditions and uh, upper airway, uh, the airway foreign bodies. So I hope uh, that should give you an idea, especially uh, in relation to casualty. So emergency sort of things that you might uh, be, should be careful of when you're managing. And uh, if you have any questions, you can email me on the email address given there or the Twitter handle. I'll try to come back to you uh, if it's possible, right? Okay, thank you. So, so that, that uh, brings, brings to a conclusion of today's, today's session, session. Uh, on uh, common ENT problems in general practice. Thank you very much again, sir, Dr. MBT Lakshan, a consultant ENT and head and neck surgeon at uh, Navalova Hospital, Colombo, and also uh, senior lecturer at uh, University of Caledonia. Thank you and good day.